Namaste, welcome back to the Pragna channel. You are watching AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate Exam Question Analysis. And we have, uh, I think, 42 new questions for this month, month of March 2024. And if you are planning to write your exam, by the time I post the next one, all the best. And uh, let's start this, I guess. <laughs> Why wait? A company needs to extract the names of ingredients from recipe records that are stored as text files in an Amazon S3 bucket. A web application will use the ingredient names to query an Amazon DynamoDB table and determine a nutrition score. The application can handle non-food records and errors. The company does not have any employees who have machine learning knowledge to develop this solution. Which solution will meet these requirement most cost effectively? Okay, when we see this, we already know most of the options will work, but we have to choose carefully based on which one is the most cost effective. Let's look at the option. One hint they are giving us is they don't have machine learning knowledge. <clears throat> Whenever the question asks that, they are indirectly telling you don't try to use SageMaker and uh, come up design a model and etc because that requires machine learning knowledge since they don't have it they are suggesting us indirectly to use a service designed by AWS that already does the machine learning for us got it so each one of the option is trying to use a specific AWS service native service which does this for us so we, let's go ahead and identify that service and depending on that service we can immediately cross out that particular option so let's start with option b and option b is using forecast amazon forecast which is a service primarily used for time series forecasting to analyze the recipe records and extract ingredients names it won't be a good fit right because forecast is not designed for text analysis or entity extraction tasks like identifying ingredients. Using forecast for this purpose would not be cost effective and may not provide accurate results, making it less suitable for this scenario. We have done a couple of projects uh, using some of these services, machine learning services, AWS native services that are designed. Um, you know, for example, extracting text from documents, extracting text from images, extracting so on and so forth, machine learning services in our AWS cloud projects for beginner to expert playlist, you know, uh, if you want to see a similar scenario, uh, you know, you can go ahead and watch those projects. We have, I think, about 16 projects that we created as part of machine learning series. So go check it out. We have total 98 projects. So maybe one of the scenarios that you want is already there. And most of the questions that we will see here are already covered as real-time projects in that playlist. So go ahead, uh, watch that playlist, the, you know, then come and prepare for this exam questions. Maybe it will uh, be easy for you once you actually see how these things are involved and how do we implement different solutions in real time. And let's look at option C. This involves using Amazon Polly, okay, as you can see here, to create audio recordings of recipe records and instructing employees to manually listen to the recordings and extract ingredient names. Not only is this approach labor intensive and error prone, but it also does not leverage machine learning capabilities for automatic extraction, making it less efficient and cost effective. And let's look at option D. This option utilizes SageMaker, which is a fully managed machine learning service to analyze the text and extract ingredient names. SageMaker provides flexibility and scalability for building and deploying machine learning models, including custom models for text analysis tasks. While SageMaker may incur additional costs compared to serv different services specifically designed to do this, it offers the most accurate customizable solution for extracting ingredients name from recipe records. But as I mentioned previously, this requires you to have machine learning knowledge. You cannot just open SageMaker and, uh, you know, tell it to do whatever you want to. No, you, you need machine learning uh, knowledge 
to use SageMaker. So that will leave us with option A. And what is it using? It is using Comprehend, Amazon Comprehend. As I said, we have already done a project which uses Amazon Comprehend. So this utilizes S3 event notifications to trigger a Lambda function when new recipe records are uploaded to S3 bucket. The Lambda function analyzes the text using Amazon Comprehend to extract ingredient names. Amazon Comprehend is a natural language processing or NLP service that can identify entities such as food ingredients. It knows what is, a, what is food ingredients and what is not. This solution is cost effective as it only uses Lambda and Comprehend, both of which offer a pay per use pricing model. But the important part of this solution is you don't need machine learning knowledge to use Comprehend. If you don't believe me, go check that project. I think the project will be between project uh, 80 and 97, one of the project. Most likely it will be around 90 or 91. You can check that playlist. That playlist, again, not just that playlist, all the playlists on this channel are put in the description of each and every video. So go ahead and check the description of the video to find the projects. A company needs to create an AWS Lambda function that will run in a VPC in the company's primary AWS account. The Lambda function needs to access files that the company stores in an EFS file system. The EFS file system is located in a secondary AWS account. As the company adds files to the file system, the solution must scale to meet the demand. Which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively? Another cost effective question. Create a new EFS file system in the primary account. Use data syncs to, to copy the contents of the original EFS file system to the new EFS file system. Okay, this option involves creating a complete new EFS file system in the primary account and using data sync to copy the contents of the original EFS file system from the secondary account to the new one. While this approach ensures that the Lambda function can access files in the primary account, it requires additional resources and may not be the most cost effective solution, especially if the data needs to be synchronized regularly. So let's cross this out. And let's look at option C. This option involves creating a second Lambda function in the secondary account that has access to EFS file system. The primary account's Lambda function then invokes the secondary account's Lambda function to perform file operations. While technically feasible, this approach introduces unnecessary complexity and additional overhead in managing multiple Lambda functions and invocations across accounts, making it less cost effective and efficient. So let's cross this out. And option D uses Lambda layers, which are a way to centrally manage code and dependencies that can be reused across multiple Lambda functions. This option suggests moving the contents of the file system to Lambda layer and configuring permissions to allow the secondary account to access the layer. However, Lambda functions are limited in size and storing large amounts of data such as files from an EFS file system may not be practical. Additionally, Lambda layers are primarily used for code and dependencies, not for storing data files. Hence, we can cross this out. So that leaves us with option B, which is using VPC peering, which allows communication between VPCs in different AWS accounts using private IP addresses. By creating a VPC peering connection between the VPCs in the primary and secondary accounts, the Lambda function in the primary account can access files stored in the EFS file system in the secondary account directly. This solution eliminates the need for data duplication and synchronization, making it cost effective and efficient for accessing files across accounts. And if you are thinking creating a VPC peering connection is too complex and etc., then watch one of the project, not one, actually we have done a couple of projects in our uh, real-time projects playlist where we created a VPC peering as well as transit gateway peering across regions, even VPC peering across regions, not just across multiple accounts. So definitely go check out again uh, the AWS uh, cloud real-time projects playlist. We have done several projects where we did VPC peering. A financial company needs to handle highly sensitive data. The company will store the data in S3 bucket. The company needs to ensure that the data is encrypted 
in transit and at rest the company must manage the encryption keys outside the cloud which solution will meet these requirements all right first of all we already know that if you think about encrypting in transit then we will think of ssl and certificates and at rest we will think of kms okay but none of the option are talking about certificates and everything is talking about encrypting uh, using kms or something like that so if you want to ensure that the data is encrypted in transit and at rest what do you what do you or what you should do right you cannot obviously encrypt at the server side because that will miss encrypting in the transit encryption server side means what the data will come then you encrypt on the server which is at the rest okay which will defeat the purpose of the question which is not what they want it has to be already encrypted before you even read which means on the client side it has to be encrypted so just think of you know question that way so that you will know the difference between client side encryption and server side encryption so clearly this question is asking about client side encryption which will immediately eliminate abc because all three three options are using server side encryption server side encryption means you will encrypt after you get the file okay not before so that will leave us with option d which is talking about encrypt the data at the company's data center so you will encrypt it then you will copy the data to s3 which means it will be encrypted already encrypted in transit and also address because it's already and it will also satisfy the condition manage the encryption keys outside the cloud since you are encrypting it at the company's data center obviously you are going to manage it outside the aws cloud so that's it's a simple question once you identify if it is the server side encryption or the client side then you got the answer a company wants to run its payment application on aws the application receives payment notifications from mobile devices payment notifications require a basic validation before they are sent for further processing the backend processing application is long running and requires compute and memory to be adjusted the company does not want to manage the infrastructure which solution will meet these requirements with the least operational overhead i think the reason they mentioned long running to be adjusted they are just trying telling us to eliminate any lambda options in case if they mention using lambda to do this uh, because again long running lambda has a limitation of 15 minutes so forget about it and etc so let's look at the uh, options okay option a we are create an sqs queue and what is an sqs queue it provides a scalable and managed message queue for decoupling components and then integrate the queue with amazon event bridge rule to receive payment notifications from mobile devices event bridge will allow receiving payment notifications and triggering and rules good and then configure the rule to validate payment notifications and send the notifications to the backend application deploy the backend application on eks anywhere okay create a standalone cluster again i mentioned this multiple times in multiple exam analysis questions that only try to use eks if they mention in the question that they have e kubernetes on premise and they want to migrate it to aws so then only you will use eks other than that always go for ecs by default because ecs is amazon native service whereas eks or kubernetes service is not okay so deploying and managing eks anywhere might introduce additional co operational complexity compared to fully managed services for that reason we'll cross this out and option b is trying to use api gateway which acts as the entry point for receiving payment notifications and aws step functions which enables building serverless workforce to validate payment notifications and then they are again using eks so same logic applies here so we'll cross that out and option c is trying to use sqs which is used for queuing payment notifications then again event bridge which triggers events based on rules for further processing and here they are trying to use ec2 spot instances any time you see ec2 spot instances in the options and if the question is not talking about application can handle failures and etc you can cross it out okay because why 
spot instances have the problem of getting terminated whenever the bid price you bid is increased right because it's not guaranteed compute power whenever the price increases amazon will take away the compute power that they gave you okay so managing spot instances and spot fleets adds operational complexity compared to other services for that reason never ever pick any option that has spot instances only pick it if the question says the application can handle failures and option d is using api gateway which receives payment notifications then it is using lambda in the beginning of the question i said eliminate lambda but i am talking about back end processes remember there are two processes here don't get confused by it you cannot use lambda for back end processing because these are long running but front end these are just notifications you can definitely use it so they are using lambda for basic validation of payment notifications and then they are using ecs with fargate for the back end which offers serverless container orchestration eliminating the need to manage any infrastructure so basically this option involves the least operational overhead as it leverages fully managed services like lambda and fargate where aws manages the underlying infrastructure hence d is our correct option a solutions architect is designing a user authentication solution for a company the solution must invoke two factor authentication for users that log in from inconsistent geographical locations ip addresses or devices the solution must also be able to scale to accommodate millions of users which solution will meet these requirements so design user authentication for a company okay so this is not for aws cloud remember you need to identify whenever they ask sign in options most of the time if they are talking about sign in options for a third party applications or a mobile app or for a website blindly go for cognito not iam iam is to log in and get authenticated for aws services not for third party applications or websites or apps mobile app users etc so that is just a give here they are just giving away the answer saying like go for cognitive not for iam so based on that you can easily eliminate c and d and go for ab but i will explain why you cannot use option c and d i can cross it out both are trying to use the iam as i just mentioned right iam identity center option d uh, it provides centralized access management for multiple aws accounts and business applications okay remember that keep that in mind okay while aws sso supports mfa it is primarily designed for managing access to multiple aws accounts and applications within an organization it may not be suitable uh, for user authentication in a scenario with millions of users especially considering the requirement for invoking mfa based on user behavior think about it if you have to use iam are you going to create all those users in your iam account which is not possible millions of users right instead you will go with that one i think even for option c uh, the same explanation applies so i don't have to explain that one so between a and b if you look at it both are using cognito but one is using user pools identity other one is using identity pool so what is the difference so let's look at option b okay so why uh, amazon cognito identity pools offers authentication capabilities it does offer authentication capabilities but they are primarily used for providing temporary aws credentials for accessing aws services rather than user authentication with mfa based on user behavior this option may not fully address the requirement for invoking mfa based on inconsistent geographical locations ip addresses or devices so for this use case what do we use we use user pool user pools okay which is option one amazon cognitive user pools provides user authentication and management service okay and then enable the risk-based adaptive authentication which allows you to define authentication rules based on user behavior such as inconsistent geographical locations ip addresses or devices and when it comes to mfa yes this one and uh, does support mfa which enhances security by requiring users to provide two or more verification factors and if you are talking about scalability 
mean, since it's talking about accommodate millions of users, Cognito is designed to scale to accommodate millions of users. So this option overall aligns well with the requirements as it leverages Cognito's risk-based adaptive authentication feature to detect suspicious activities based on user behavior and trigger MFA when necessary. Additionally, Cognito is highly scalable and suitable for accommodating millions of users. Okay, two giveaways. It's a user authentication solution for a company not to access any AWS services and second accommodate millions of users. Those two you can just go with this particular option. A company has Amazon S3 data lake. The company needs a solution that transforms the data from the data lake and loads the data into a data warehouse every day. The data warehouse must have massively parallel processing capabilities. So we need to have a data warehouse and Sita Pregnance, you already know the only data warehouse solution that is a uh, service that is available on AWS is Redshift. Data analysts then need to create and train machine learning models by using SQL commands on the data. The solution must use serverless AWS services wherever possible. So this is again another giveaway saying, yes, Redshift has a serverless version. So just go ahead and use AWS Redshift serverless. And they are talking about machine learning and others. So let's go ahead and look at the options. Okay. So I will eliminate immediately A and B. You might ask like based on what? Why are you eliminating? We need an answer. Well, Amazon EMR is not a serverless service you have to provision emr and then you can create emr jobs that's first based on that second one redshift it's not serverless you have amazon redshift serverless that's serverless so that is another reason i would eliminate this one okay so if you are thinking about amazon EA, emr serverless what is the service well glue aws glue right aws glue is nothing but behind the scenes you have you run emr jobs but you don't have to provision it and uh, right now i think there is a, another version called emr serverless as well just look like redshift but anyways you can cancel this out and b not just for emr aurora aurora is not a data warehouse solution so you can cross that out and you can cross d out because athena is not a data warehouse solution Okay, so for that reason, you can cancel out. That will leave us with option C, where we are using two serverless glue job to transform the data, which is a serverless option. Amazon Redshift serverless, which is a serverless data warehouse option. And you can use Redshift machine learning to create and train ML models using SQL. So that's how we eliminate it. So you don't have to know um, the answer directly. You can eliminate the others and you can still get the, to the answer. A company runs containers in a Kubernetes environment in the company's local data center. See this? This is what I'm talking about. If the question clearly says on-premise, if they are using Kubernetes and if they are asking that oh, the company wants to use Amazon, EKS and other managed services, they mentioned it. So, But usually they mention something like this, then go for option that says EKS, but other than otherwise just go for ecs data must remain local in the company's data center and cannot be stored in any remote site or cloud to maintain compliance okay this is a easy giveaway remain data must remain local whenever they say that what is the service that should come to your mind outpost because outpost is what it's still AWS infrastructure, but it will sit in the company's data center. When do you, when do companies go for it? If they have complaints, problems, wherein they have to store the local data locally, not on cloud, not on AWS data center, then you will use Outpost. So that is a free giveaway. You can just go ahead and mark option C, but let's go through other options, which is local zones local zones people get confused between local zones and outposts but local zones does provide local aws infrastructure but it doesn't offer the same level of integration with the company's existing kubernetes environment and it may not meet compliance requirements if data needs to remain strictly within the company's data center because local zones is think of it as like aws has these local zones all around the world wherever there are too much user base okay unlike Outpost. Outpost means any company can uh, have that infrastructure within their data center. Local zones is like uh, famous spots, like New York, Times Square, let's assume, right? Then 
such famous crowded places aws have the local zones if there is a company which is far away from you know these crowded places then there is no local zones okay local zone then obviously the data again data won't remain locally because this is not in the company's data center local zone it's still in the aws data center but in a local zone got it and snowmobile use snowmobile in the company's data center option b this is used for snowmobile is used for what large scale data migrations and it it would not suit it would not be suitable for running managed services in the company's data center same thing with uh, snowball edge storage is designed for edge computing and data transfer scenarios and does not provide the same capabilities as outposts for running aws services locally so you don't have to go for other options whenever they said data must remain locally go for outposts outpost brings native aws services infrastructure operating models to virtually any data center co-location space or on premises facility with outpost companies can run aws infrastructure and services locally on premises and use the same apis control plane tools and hardware on premises as in the aws cloud by installing uh, AWS outpost rack in the company's data center. The company can leverage Amazon EKS and other managed services while ensuring that all data remains within the local data center meeting compliance requirements. AWS outpost provides a consistent hybrid experience with seamless integration with AWS services, allowing the company to run containerized workloads in the local Kubernetes environment alongside AWS services without data leaving the local premises. The social media company has workloads that collect and process data. The workloads store the data in on-premises NFS storage. The data store cannot scale fast enough to meet the company's expanding business needs. The company wants to migrate the current data store to AWS, which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively. Okay. Let's look at option A. AWS storage gateway volume gateway uh, with this one on premises applications can use can use block storage in the form of volumes that are stored as Amazon EBS snapshots. This option allows the company to store data in on premises NFS storage and synchronize it with S3 using storage gateway and Amazon S3 lifecycle policies can be used to transition the data to the appropriate storage class such as standard IAR S3 intelligence tiering. Um, so basically this option may incur additional costs for maintaining the storage gateway volume gateway and EBS snapshots which might not be most cost effective solution depending on the volume of data and frequency as frequency of access for that reason we will not go with volume gateway you can cross this or not and then we have option C which uses EFS which is a scalable file storage service that can be accessed from multiple EC2 instances. This option involves using standard IA storage class of Amazon EFS, which provides cost savings for infrequent access data. The company can activate an infrequent access lifecycle policy to further optimize costs. And Amazon EFS offers a fully managed solution with pay-as-you-go pricing and using the standard IA storage class with a lifecycle policy can provide cost sequence for infrequent accessed data. But why don't we pick this choice? Because it said most cost effective and the cost effective solution when it comes to storage is always S3, which is already mentioned in option A and B. For that reason, we don't go with C and D because it is using EFS. And we definitely not go with e, uh, D because it's using one zone, which means it's not highly available. If that particular zone is gone, then all the data is gone. Okay, we also don't go with this one because S3 is much cheaper than EFS. So whenever they are storage classes, we will go with option B because file gateway allows applications to store files as objects in S3 while accessing them through a NFS interface. It has the, uh, it can access NFS protocol, which is on the on-premises. Uh, similar to option A, this solution involves using S3 lifecycle policies to transition data to appropriate storage class. So yeah, again, you can even store, uh, save more money depending on the uh, storage class as well. 
okay so this is a straightforward question a company uses high concurrency aws lambda functions to process a constantly increasing number of messages in a message queue during marketing events the lambda functions use cpu intensive code to process the messages the company wants to reduce the compute cost and to maintain service latency for its customer which solution will meet these requirements so two options are using reserved concurrency and two are using provision concurrency and uh, both reserved and provision they are decreasing the memory and increasing the memory so let's see what exactly reserved concurrency does and provision concurrency does so option a is trying to use reserved concurrency which allows you to set the maximum number of concurrent executions for a lambda function okay that's basically the reserved concurrency will do and decreasing memory may reduce cost but if the lambda functions are cpu intensive reducing memory might degrade performance you might be thinking like how come decreasing memory because lambda memory uh, cpu is linked with your memory right the more memory you give the more cpu cores it increases and so on and so forth right so by reducing memory you are degrading cpu as well so this option doesn't directly address the cpu intensive nature of the workload so you can cross it out and for the same reason you can actually cross option c out why because it is also decreasing the memory allocated to the lambda function and between B and D both are increasing the memory that's there but one is using reserved another is using provision so to understand which one is the right option we already know what is reserved concurrency now let's learn about what is provisioned concurrency provisioned concurrency can help maintain low latency by pre-warming lambda functions isn't that's what we want we want to maintain service latency for its customer so we would go with provisioned concurrency instead of reserved concurrency so for that reason we will cross this out okay and increasing memory might improve performance for cpu intensity tasks and aws compute optimizer recommendations can guide in optimizing resources for cost and performance this option combines the benefits of provisioned concurrency for low latency and aws compute optimizer recommendations for cost optimization as well as performance improvement hence d is the right answer for us a company runs its workloads on ECS. The container images that the ECS task definition uses need to be scanned for common vulnerabilities and exposures. New container images that are created also need to be scanned. Which solution will meet these requirements with fewest changes to the workloads? Okay, fewest changes to the workloads means don't create a, your own solution. Try to use some feature that is available as part of these services and yes we do have something like that so let's go through the options option b involves storing container images in s3 and using amazon macy which is a data security and privacy service to scan the images for vulnerabilities and then using s3 event notifications every new object creation in s3 triggers a macy scan this approach adds complexity by introducing s3 and macy into the workflow requiring additional setup and management compared to whatever you already have so cross this out option c involves migrating workloads from ecs to eks i already told you we don't do that we don't you go for eks you can only time you go for eks is if the question mentions that is there which requires significant changes to the existing ecs setup okay and uh, option d involves storing container images again in s3 and using lambda to trigger inspector scans it adds complexity by introducing s3 lambda inspector into the workflow which requires additional setup and management similar to option b this option adds more changes and components to the existing setup compared to using ecr directly with ecs which is what option a is doing amazon ecr which is the container registry supports scanning container images for vulnerabilities using its built-in scan on push feature with scan on push filters 
Every new image puts to the repository triggers a scan for vulnerabilities. This option requires minimal changes to the existing ECS setup as it already leverages Amazon ECR which is commonly used with ECS for storing container images. It directly integrates with the container image repository without additional services. I mentioned it even at the beginning. A company uses an AWS batch job to run its end of day sales process. The company needs a serverless solution that will invoke a third party reporting application when the AWS batch job is successful. The reporting application has an HTTP API interface that uses username and password authentication. Which solution will meet these requirements? Okay. Option B is trying to use event bridge scheduler. Um, actually, while event bridge scheduler allows triggering events at specific times or intervals, it may not be the best fit for triggering actions based on job completion events like A, B, AWS batch job is successful, right? You do, you are not, you are, you should not be scheduling it. You are supposed to trigger it based on the success of the job. So for that reason, cancel B. And option C involves publishing AWS batch job success events to API Gateway REST API. While it's feasible, it introduces complexity by requiring setup and management of API Gateway resources. Directly invoking the third party API from event bridge notifications is more straightforward, which we will see in a minute. And option D adds an extra layer of indirection by invoking AWS Lambda function through API Gateway. It offers flexibility, but it increases complexity without significant benefits. For that reason, we'll cancel this out. So what are we going to do? We are going to go with option A because this aligns well with using events to trigger actions based on AWS batch job state changes, not scheduled. So by configuring event bridge rule to match AWS batch job success events and sending them to an API destination, you can achieve the desired outcome effectively. Event bridge provides seamless integration with various AWS services, including batch and API gateway, making it a suitable choice for event-driven architectures. You can mention the third-party HTTP API interface that uses username password authentication as the target to event bridge, if you aren't aware of that. So overall, this option remains our best option for this scenario. The company collects and processes data from a vendor the vendor stores its data in an Amazon RDS for MySQL database in the vendor's own AWS account. The company's VPC does not have an internet gateway, an AWS direct connect connection or AWS site-to-site -site VPN connection. The company needs to access the data that is in the vendor database. Which solution will meet this requirement? Option A involves the vendor signing up for the AWS hosted connection, direct connection, connect program which establishes a direct, uh, sorry, dedicated connection between the company's VPC and the vendor's VPC. VPC peering is then used to connect the two VPCs, allowing traffic to flow securely between them. While this solution provides a direct and secure connection between the VPCs, it requires coordination with the vendor to set up the direct connect connection, which might introduce additional complexity and dependencies. Overall, this solution can be effective, but might involve more coordination and setup effort. For that reason, cancel that out. Option B involves setting up a client VPN connection between the company's VPC and the vendor's VPC, allowing secure access to resources in the vendor's VPC. While this solution provides secure access to the vendor's resources, setting up and managing a client VPN connection might introduce overall overhead and complexity. Moreover, client VPN connections are typically used for remote access scenarios and using them for inter-VPC communication might not be the most straightforward approach. Overall, this solution might be less optimal due to the additional complexity and overhead of managing a client VPN connection. And option D, involves using transit gateway to integrate the company's VPC and vendor's VPC, allowing for centralized management and routing of traffic between multiple VPCs. 
and VPC peering, peering is then used to establish connectivity between the company's VPC and vendor VPC. While Transit Gateway provides centralized management and routing capabilities, it might introduce additional complexity and overhead, especially if the setup is not already in place. Since the company's VPC does not have internet access, Transit Gateway might not be the most straightforward solution for this scenario. And overall, this using Transit Gateway might be overkill for specific requirements of accessing a single RDS database in the vendor's VPC. Transit Gateway is like a centralized hub. If you have more VPCs, more than two VPCs, you want to communicate between each other, etc. Here, all you need to do is access database. Why do we want to go with VPC peering? VPC peering means you are literally giving access to this entire VPC, which is like against the principle of least privilege, right? So for that reason, we won't go with any of those options. Instead, we'll go with option C, which makes sure to give access to only that particular service instead of the entire VPC. This involves the vendor setting up a network load balancer in front of the RDS database and using AWS private link to integrate the company's VPC and the vendor's VPC. Private link provides private connectivity between VPCs without requiring internet gateways. VPN connections are direct connect. By using private link, company can securely access resources in the vendor's VPC without exposing them to the public internet. Overall, this solution provides secure and private connectivity between the VPCs without the need for complex networking setups, making it our only option for this solution. A company wants to set up Amazon managed Grafana as its visualization tool. The company wants to visualize data from its Amazon RDS database as one data source. The company needs a secure solution that will not, will not expose data over internet. Whenever you hear that word, what should come to your mind? Okay, I will go through the options, but will not expose the data over the internet, which means you cannot use uh, um, the, what do you call it? You cannot use NAT gateway. You cannot use any such things because they all traverse through public. Okay, so whenever you see this, think of endpoints, but let's go through the options. Option A involves creating an Amazon managed Grafana workspace without a VPC. Whenever you see without a VPC, which means it will have a public endpoint accessible over the internet. So whenever, as soon as you see that, cancel it. And you can also cancel this one out. Why are we canceling C? Because even this is trying to use Grafana without a VPC. So both are gone. But let's go ahead with the remaining. Um, and RDS database also has a public endpoint, which means data transfer between Grafana and RDS will occur over the internet. While this option is relatively straightforward to set up, it exposes both Grafana and RDS to the public internet, which might not align with the company's requirement for a secure solution. Exposing sensitive data over the internet can introduce security risk and compliance concerns, so gone. And option C involves again without a VPC, but establishing a connection between Grafana and RDS using private link, which is our previous question. Private link allows private connectivity between services across different VPCs or accounts without exposing the data over the internet. While this option leverages private link for secure communication between Grafana and RDS, it still exposes Grafana to the public internet, which might not align with the requirement for a secure solution. And then we have option D, this involves creating Amazon managed Grafana in a VPC, but using a public endpoint for RDS database. While Grafana workspace remains within the VPC, the use of public RDS endpoint means that data transfer between Grafana and RDS will occur over the public internet, which might not be desirable from a security perspective. So that will leave us with option B, wherein we are creating Grafana workspace in a VPC and configuring it with a private endpoint, ensuring that it is not accessible over the public internet. RDS database also has a private endpoint within the same VPC, ensuring that data transfer between Grafana and RDS remains within the AWS network 
and does not traverse the public internet. By using private endpoints and keeping the communication within the VPC, this option provides a more secure solution compared to A, C or D. The company hosts a data lake on S3. The data lake ingests data in Apache Parquet format from various data sources. The company uses multiple transformation steps to prepare the ingested data. The steps include filtering of anomalies, normalization of data to standard date and time values and generation of aggregates for analysis. The company must store the transformed data in S3 buckets that data analysts has access. The company needs a pre-built solution for data transformation that does not require code. The solution must provide data lineage and data profiling. The company needs to share the data transformation steps with employees throughout the company. Which solution will meet these requirements? Okay, so before me going into these options, I will just show you one uh, documentation. I guess based on that, you can easily pick the answer. Okay. So as you can see, Glue Studio is a graphical interface to do all this, but Data Brew is a visual data preparation tool that enables you to do all this. It already has 200 transformations built in, which you, it provides Glue Studio as well. But the option or the answer that we are looking for in this particular question is Data Brew. So you can immediately eliminate the studio. And uh, this one because none of these are visual data preparation tools and the question clearly asks for that one oh, i mean i don't think it is asking exactly for the visual uh, but it is definitely asking for pre-built solution for data transformation which is only available in the data brew right uh, read this documentation read this documentation which is exactly what the question is asking about and then you will have a pretty uh, clear answer okay so option is answer c this is a visual data preparation tool that allows users to clean transform data without writing code and data brew provides an NTA2 interface for creating data transformation recipes making it accessible to users without coding expertise users can easily share transformation steps which are recipes with employees by using data brew's collaboration features and data brew also offers data lineage and data profiling capabilities ensuring visibility into data transformations a solutions architect runs a web application on multiple EC2 instances that are in individual target groups behind an ALB. Users can reach the application through public website. The solutions architect wants to allow engineers to use a development version of the website to access one specific development EC2 instance to test new features for the application. The solutions architect wants to use an Amazon Route 53 hosted zone to give the engineers access to the development instance. The solution must automatically route to the development instance even if the development instance is replaced which solution will meet these requirements we have done similar scenario uh, as one of the project in the aws cloud projects for beginner to expert go check it out but let's go through these options option b involves assigning a public ip directly to the development instance and creating a dns record pointing to that ip address while this approach may work it doesn't leverage the benefits of load balancing and scalability provided by alb additionally if the development instance is replaced the public ip address may change requiring updates to the dns records hence gone and option c similar to a uses an a record to point to the ALB and creates a listener role to handle requests for the development website. However, instead of forwarding requests to the target group, it directs, it redirects them to the public IP of the development instance. While this setup may work, it introduces complexity and potential performance overhead due to the redirection and it may not provide seamless failover if the development instance is replaced. Option D involves placing all instances, including the development instance, in the same target group behind the ALB. Requests for the development website are routed to the ALB using a DNS A record and a listener role on the ALB forwards these requests to the target group. 
Similar to option A, this setup allows for automatic routing to the development instance, even if it is replaced as long as it remains registered in the target group. Okay, so why are we not going to pick this one? Because you should not be putting all instances in the same target group. You are supposed to only put the development instance in that, which is what option A is doing. For that reason, we will pick option A. Okay. Why? Because this option sets up a DNS record pointing to the ALB, ensuring that requests for the development website are routed to the load balancer. By creating a listener rule on the ALB, requests for the development website can be forwarded to the target group containing the development instance. This setup allows for automatic routing to the development instance even if it is replaced as long as the instance is registered in the target group. A company runs a container application on a Kubernetes cluster in the company's data center. The application uses advanced message queuing protocol AMQP to communicate with a message queue. The data center cannot scale fast enough to meet the company's expanding business needs. The company wants to migrate the workloads to AWS. Which solution will meet these requirements with the least operational overhead? Okay, this one will be an easy one. Uh, you can cross out SQS because SQS doesn't support AMQP protocol. This is basic. SQS is basic. And uh, the I think you can cross this one out as well because this is using SQS. You, we can leave with BNC because both are using AMQ or Amazon, sorry, Amazon MQ. So for that reason, we'll keep Amazon MQ uh, supports the uh, messaging AMQP. And between B and C, okay, this is your chance to pick uh, Kubernetes service because they are using Kubernetes cluster. So that's for that reason, we'll go ahead and pick option B instead of option C, using highly available EC2 instances to run the application. Okay, so cross that out. This is an easy pick, right? Don't you think so? Because we are talking about containerized services and least of, so as soon as you see this, you can cross out any option that has EC2. Not just in this question, any question you see. Least operational overhead crossed out because EC2 instances are not least operational overhead, maybe like the most operational overhead. An online gaming company hosts its platform on EC2 instances behind NLBs across multiple AWS regions. NLBs can route requests to targets over the internet. The company wants to improve the customer playing experience by reducing end to end load time for its global customer base load time which solution will meet these requirements option a is trying to use alb's which are designed to optimize traffic distribution at the application layer providing advanced features such as content based routing ssl offloading and integration with aws services like waf however replacing nlb's with alb's might involve changes to the application setup and configuration while ALBs can improve performance in some main scenarios, they may not significantly reduce end-to-end -end load time unless there are specific optimizations in the application layer that ALBs can leverage. This option might not provide the desired improvement in load time without further optimizations. Cross it out. And again, usually when you talk about online gaming, the traffic is usually UDP and you clearly know ALB doesn't support, ALB supports HTTP and HTTPS. And option B configure is talking about configuring Route 53, which is a DNS service that can distribute incoming traffic across multiple endpoints, including NLBs in different AWS regions. And by using weighted routing policies, you can distribute traffic evenly across NLBs, which can help balance the load and potentially reduce latency by directing users to the closest region. This solution might help in distributing traffic efficiently but not directly addresses reducing end-to-end -end load time and option c uh, while adding more nlbs and ec2 instances in regions with large customer bases can help distribute the load and reduce latency for customers in those regions it doesn't address the global load time issue for all customers it may increase infrastructure complexity and cost without necessarily providing significant improvements in load time for customers in other regions for that reason gone so we are left with option a 
okay it's trying to use global accelerator as the name suggests global accelerator it accelerates the load times okay so it is a networking service that improves the availability and performance of your applications with local and global traffic load balancing as well as health checks by configuring the existing nlbs as a target endpoints in global accelerator traffic can be intelligently routed over AWS global network to the closest entry point to the AWS network, reducing the end-to-end -end load time for customers globally. This solution provides a centralized approach to optimize global traffic flow without requiring changes to the existing infrastructure setup. A company has an on-premises application that uses SFTP to collect financial data from multiple vendors. The company is migrating to AWS Cloud. The company has created an application that uses S3 APIs to upload files from vendors. Some vendors run their systems on legacy applications that do not support S3 APIs. The vendors want to continue to use SFTP based applications to upload data. The company wants to use managed services for the needs of vendors that use legacy applications. Which solution will meet these requirements with least operational overhead? Okay, as soon as you see SFTP and then managed, then you have to think of a managed SFTP service on AWS, which is transfer family. So you can go ahead and cancel out pretty much this option, this option. Oh, basically all these options because none of them are managed services for SFTP. Option B is the only one. So AWS Transfer Family provides fully managed SFTP, FTPS and FTP servers for easy migration of file transfer workloads to AWS. And the Transfer Family with it, you can create SFTP endpoints that allow vendors with legacy applications to upload data securely to S3 using their existing SFTP clients. This solution eliminates the need for managing infrastructures or servers as AWS handles the underlying infrastructure scaling and maintenance. This is the only one that satisfies the condition of use managed services. A marketing team wants to build a campaign for an upcoming multi-sport event. The team has news reports from the past five years in PDF format. The team needs a solution to extract insights about the content and sentiment of the news reports. The solution must use text track to process the news reports, which solution will meet these requirements with least operational overhead. And uh, yes, as you might have guessed, we already have a project based on text track. I think the project number is uh, 91 or 92. Check in 90s um, in the same playlist that I mentioned before, where we use text track. And we, have, we already, I think not just one project, I think we did use multiple projects where we use text tract. Okay, let's look at the options. And what are we looking at? We want to analyze, extract insights about the content sentiment of the news reports, which we have already seen a similar question. So if you figured that out, then you know the, which one is the answer. Option A, they are trying to use Athena. Uh, which is a serverless interactive query service that allows querying data stored in S3 using SQL. Storing the extracted insights in S3 and then querying them with Athena can provide flexibility in analyzing the data. However, using Athena for sentiment analysis, analysis would require additional custom SQL queries or integrating with other services. While Athena itself has low operational overhead, additional steps might be needed for sentiment analysis because this is not a machine learning service. So it doesn't do the sentiment analysis on its own. And option B is trying to use uh, the extracted insights DynamoDB and then SageMaker to build a sentiment model. Storing insights in DynamoDB can provide fast and scalable access to data and using SageMaker to build a custom sentiment analysis model based on extracted insight might work. But this requires setting up and managing SageMaker Notebook instance, training and deploying a machine learning model, which adds operational overhead. And DynamoDB itself is managed, building and managing SageMaker model introduces complexity. Again, we won't go with it. We want to go with a managed service for sentiment analysis. Okay, not try to create our own service. So option D is trying to use uh, store the insights in S3 and use QuickSight. QuickSight is not a sentiment analysis service. It is a visualization tool, 
right so performing sentiment analysis would require additional integration with other services again uh, sage maker or comprehend we have already seen one question that used comprehend right because this is fully managed nlp natural language processing service that can perform sentiment analysis on text data it knows all words sending the extracted insights directly to comprehend for sentiment analysis reduces operational overhead as comprehend handles the analysis saving the analysis results to s3 allows for further storage and downstream processing if needed this approach minimizes the need for additional setup or management as comprehend is fully managed by aws got it i just took a break i hope you all took a break as well if not take a break because we are at the midpoint i forgot that this had 42 questions i thought it had 25 questions so that's why i said initially that i will try to finish this within one and a half hour but i think it will take <clears throat> more than that and if you haven't subscribed to this channel go ahead and do so and don't forget to hit the like and comment on each video that you see that way it will really help this channel uh, with the whole youtube algorithm and etc so please go ahead and do that and uh, uh, I have mentioned this in other certification exams. If you need PDF for any exam, I mean, if I am uploading the videos, then you don't need, but any exam that I don't upload on this channel, if you need a PDF, I can provide that, but I have to get it. Um, so that would be $25. I will give the, all the questions with the answers, any certification exam uh, you want. I can get that for you guys, but I have to get, so I have to pay as well. Um, so that's why it's $25 if you are interested again if not that's all right and you can uh, support this channel by becoming a member as well and you already know the perks of becoming a member any video that I upload all those questions will be available as PDF um, as part of the membership okay thank you very much for all the support and love you guys are showing I really appreciate it. So let's continue with the questions. A company's applications runs on EC2 instances that are in multiple availability zones. The application needs to ingest real-time data from third-party applications. The company needs a data ingestion solution that places the ingested raw data in S3 bucket. Which solution will meet these requirements? So you see real-time, which means one of the Kinesis family. Uh, <clears throat> service and then we are looking at multiple availability zones. so let's go and scan through the applications option B <clears throat> uh, is trying to use DMS while DMS can replicate ongoing data changes it might not be best fit for real-time ingestion from third-party applications and setting up DMS for this purpose might introduce unnecessary complexity compared to solutions designed specifically for real-time data ingestions. So for that reason, we'll cancel this out. Option C, AWS Data Sync is more suitable for periodic or bulk data transfers rather than continuous streams of real-time data. <clears throat> it may not provide the necessary capabilities for ingesting real-time data. That's gone. So basically, you could have immediately eliminated these two because none of those have the real-time capability, whereas A and D, both are using trying to use at least some kind of Kinesis service. And option D is trying to use Direct Connect, which can provide a dedicated network connection. It's not explicitly required for real-time data ingestion. So nowhere in the question, even they are asking about a dedicated connection. And however, Kinesis Data Firehose with Direct Connect can still enable direct and efficient data ingestion from third-party applications to S3 in real time. Uh, but anyways, we don't need this because of that. And again, if you see, to consume direct put operations from the real time, that would not give us the real time, almost real time. Maybe that will give near, I guess. But anyways, whenever you see real time, go for Kinesis data streams for the data ingestion instead of the put operations from the application. So which is option A? This is well suited for real time data ingestion scenarios, allowing applications to ingest and process large streams of data in real time. And data firehose 
can then deliver the processed data to S3, providing scalability and reliability for data delivery. And this solution is suitable for handling continuous streams of data from third party applications in real time. And we already know data warehouse can directly write to S3. That's another added bonus. The company's application is receiving data from multiple data sources. The size of the data varies as and is expected to increase over time. The current maximum size is 700 KB. The data volume and data size continue to grow as more data sources are added. The company decides to use an Amazon DynamoDB as the primary data face for the application. A solutions architect needs to identify a solution that handles the large data sizes. Which solution will meet these requirements most operationally efficient way <clears throat> option a involves offloading large data from dynamo db to amazon document db which is better suited for storing large documents while it addresses the size limitation of dynamo db it introduces complexity with data synchronization between doc dynamo db and document db it may not be the most operationally efficient solution due to the need for managing data in two different databases. And option C aims to distribute large data across multiple items to fit within DynamoDB size limits. While it addresses the size limitation, it may lead to increased complexity in managing and querying data, especially for retrieval and updates spanning multiple items. Items in the sense records you cannot put one record into multiple records or rows right it will just increase complexity <clears throat> and option d aims to reduce the size of large objects using compression before storing them in dynamo db while compression can help reduce storage costs and optimize network bandwidth it may not fully address the size limitation of dynamo db items decompression is required upon retrieval potentially adding processing overhead <clears throat> so for that reason we will go with option B, what is it doing <clears throat> that is that the other options didn't do? It leverages the scalability and cost effectiveness of S3 for storing large objects. And DynamoDB stores metadata or pointers to the objects in S3, allowing efficient retrieval when needed. It's a commonly used pattern for uh, handling large payloads in DynamoDB, providing a scalable and efficient solution. Usually, uh, such use, uh, scenario, not scenario, such solution is used with uh, images and uh, video files or audio files etc but even in, in this case we can use it the company is migrating a legacy application from an on-premise data center to aws the application relies on hundreds of cron jobs that run between 1 and 20 minutes on different recurring schedules throughout the day the company wants a solution to schedule and run the cron jobs on aws with minimal refactoring schedule between 1 and 20 minutes. This solution must support running the cron jobs in response to an event in the future. Okay. First of all, 1 and 20 minutes eliminates any lambda options that we have because lambda has limitations of 15 minutes. So we cannot technically use this because some of them are running more than 15 minutes. So whichever option mentions lambda function, we can eliminate it. Um, if we scan through it, Okay, technically none of them are using, but anyways, let's go through. Oh, here we go. Option A is trying to use it, so you can go ahead and cross this out because we cannot use lambda function for this particular solution. Okay, um, then let's look at option B. This option involves using AWS batch to execute the current jobs. And uh, if you already know, AWS batch is well suited for batch processing tasks, but it may introduce additional complexity compared to other options, especially for short running tasks like cron jobs. So for that reason, we don't want this. And all of them are creating container images for cron jobs. So whenever you have container images, what solution should come to your mind? ECS, which is what they are using, but use batch on ECS. That is the problem. And option D involves using step functions to orchestrate the execution of cron jobs. While step functions can handle workflows and state management, it may introduce additional complexity compared to using event bridge which is what option c is doing option c suggests using fargate to run the containerized cron jobs triggered by event bridge scheduler 
Fargate provides a serverless compute for containers, allowing for easy scaling and management without the need to provision or manage servers. For that reason, we will pick option C. The company uses Salesforce. The company needs to load existing data and ongoing data changes from Salesforce to Redshift for analysis. The company does not want the data to travel over the public internet. Again, this is again, I think, third question which is talking about data to travel over the public. They don't want same sentence. And what is, what did I suggest you during that? Which solution will make this a good least operational overhead? Okay, so whenever they say data to travel over public internet, what we are trying to say is use endpoints or endpoints actually use private links so either private link or endpoint we already seen two questions that use a private link so you can directly go ahead and pick that as the answer because we only have one option that is trying to use private link why can't we use other options because most of them travel through public internet. For example, option A, which is using VPN connection. This involves setting up a VPN connection between the company's VPC and Salesforce. The VPN connection provides a secure tunnel over the public internet, allowing data to be transferred securely between the VPC and Salesforce. Okay, so that is good enough for us to cancel this because we don't want it to travel through public internet. And option B, AWS Direct Connect, Similar to A, this approach involves establishing a direct, dedicated private connection between VPC and Salesforce using Direct Connect. Direct Connect provides a private and dedicated connection to Salesforce network. Okay. So why don't we want to use this? Well, let's look at the others as well. And it is trying to use Glue Data Brew. Similar to option A, Data Brew is utilized for data transfer, which may not be ideal tool for this purpose because we want to transfer data and we already learned what is data brew it is a visual um, tool to design etl jobs or extract or cleanse data right not to transfer data so do you want to use data brew for doing that of course not so then we have option d using VPC peering connection. VPC peering allows communication between two VPCs within the same or different AWS accounts. This option suggests establishing a VPC peering connection between the company's VPC and Salesforce VPC. Okay, so setting up VPC peering involves configuration, configuring route tables, security groups, ensuring proper network connectivity between the VPCs, right? But just to access that, do you, do you think the Salesforce will let us, you know, like, oh, can we peer VPC connection to you? Of course not. So no, right? No, they won't let us do that. Okay, that is, you know, you can a uh, big cross. Don't ever do VPC peering connection if you want to just access one tool. And this is a third part. This is not even our VPC. It's Salesforce VPC. They will never let us do the VPC connection with theirs. And again, uh, it's using app flow which we learn about it because even option C is trying to use app flow. Okay, so we, let's learn about that in the option C. Private link connection. Private link allows you to securely connect your VPC to supported AWS services and Salesforce privately without using the public internet. This ensures data transfer occurs over private connections, enhancing security and compliance. Then what about app flow? App flow is a fully managed integration service that enables you to Securely transfer data between AWS services and SaaS applications. Whenever you see a SaaS application, just pick app flow. Okay. Salesforce is an example of SaaS application if you are if you all already, already figured it out. It provides built-in connectors for Salesforce, simplifying the data transfer process without the need for custom development. Okay, option C is our answer which offers the least developmental effort because it leverages the capabilities of private link and app flow which are managed services you do not need to build or maintain custom vpn connections like a and b or manage vpc peering connections like option d instead you can quickly set up the private link connection and configure data transfer using app flow's user-friendly interface reducing development time and effort 
The company recently migrated its applications to AWS. The application runs on EC2 Linux instances in an auto scaling group across multiple availability zones. The application stores data in an elastic file system that uses EFS standard in frequent access storage. The application indexes the company's files. The index is stored in an Amazon RDS database. The company needs to optimize storage costs with some application and service changes. Which solution will meet these requirements most cost effect eff effectively? Okay, let's look at the options. All the options. Um, two of the options S3, two of the options Amazon FSX. So let's go through each FSX first. Option B is trying to use FSX for Windows file server. You can immediately cross this out because they clearly said they are running on EC2 Linux. So you don't have to use the uh, the Linux file server file server and option C is trying to use FSX for open ZFS uh, This option involves deploying FSX for open ZFS which provides fully managed file system shares based on open ZFS file system and then update the application to use the new mount point so this um, needs to be updated to use NFS or SMB protocol to access files from the FSX file shares, right? So similar to B, this provides a managed file storage solution, but it may not be the most cost effective option because whenever you talk about storage and if there is S3, then that is the cheapest option that is available. And also, um, you know, different options like A is trying to use intelligence steering and when you compare with that, this is not the cheapest at all okay so then we are left with option a and d option d is uh, both use s3 but uh, option d uses s3 glacier flexible retrieval and then copy all the files to s3 bucket update the application to use s3 api to store and retrieve files as standard retrievals while storing data in Glacier offers lower storage costs, accessing data using standard retrievals may incur additional costs compared to S3 intelligence steering. Additionally, the application update effort is required. So for that reason, you will cross this out. Then we are left with option A, which is also using S3, but it uses intelligence steering lifecycle policy. And then we copy all the files to S3 bucket, then update the application to use S3 API to store and retrieve files, right? Intelligence steering leverages uh, or, you know, this moves objects between two access tiers, right? Frequent access and infrequent access based on their access pattern. This can help optimize storage costs by moving less frequently accessed data to the infrequent access tier. So overall, this option can be cost effective at it, as it leverages S3 intelligence steering which automatically adjusts storage cost based on access patterns. Okay, so for that reason, we will pick option A as our answer. A robotics company is designing a solution for medical surgery. The robots will use advanced sensors, cameras, and AI algorithms to perceive their environment and to complete surgeries. The company needs a public load balancer in the AWS cloud that will ensure seamless communication with backend services. The load balancer must be capable of routing traffic, routing traffic based on query strings to different target groups. The tra traffic must also be encrypted. I think just this sentence is giving away the answer. Only application load balancer has the capability to route traffic based on query strings. So we look for anything that mentions application load balancers, which is option C. You can immediately go ahead and cross this out because NLB doesn't support routing based on query strings. So does gateway load balancer, it doesn't. And again, NLB is at layer four, gateway load balancer is at layer three, and uh, application load balancer is at level, layer seven, okay? so. Since we only have one option, we can just go ahead and pick that particular option. ALB is designed to route traffic at the application layer of the OSI model. It supports advanced routing features such as HTTP and HTTPS traffic routing based on various attributes, including 
HTTP headers, URL paths and query parameters. ACM certificate can be attached to ALB to ensure the traffic to the load balancer is encrypted. ALB supports query parameter based routing allowing you to route traffic based on specific parameters within HTTP requests. This aligns with the requirement for routing traffic based on query strings. A company has an application that runs on a single Amazon EC2 instance. The application uses a MySQL database that runs on the same EC2 instance. The company needs a highly available and automatically scalable solution to handle increased traffic. Which solution will meet this requirement? <clears throat> okay, first, highly available means usually you will consider a multi-AZ and uh, or serverless right because even serverless are highly available automatically scalable means you think of scaling groups auto scaling groups so let's see which options it is using auto scaling group this is using auto scaling group b and d are not using it so you can go ahead and immediately cancel them out but let's go through the different options so let's go through these options that are not using auto scaling group option b uh, as far as highly available to considered Amazon RDS for MySQL cluster that has multiple instances. Well, usually deploying multi-AZ ensures um, automatic failure to standby instances in case of an AZ failure. But here we are talking about has multiple instances. Well, would you consider this as highly available? I wouldn't because they are not telling us are these multiple instances in the same availability zone or different availability zone? If they are in the same availability zone and if availability goes down, then both are gone. So it's I wouldn't consider it as being highly available. And uh, option D, create an Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis cluster that uses MySQL connector. Why do you want to use a in-memory database in place of a RDBMS obviously I won't use it at all even with this maybe if this is highly available but nah we don't want to use uh, this one for MySQL so that will leave us with A and C and both are using auto scaling groups but let's look at the database here create a Redshift cluster that has multiple compatible nodes MySQL compatible and what does that even mean Redshift is primarily what? A data warehousing solution for analytics. Therefore, this option doesn't directly address the requirement for a MySQL database. So forget about it. You don't need this at all. Instead, when we can actually use Aurora serverless MySQL, it's serverless. So obviously, it is highly scalable and you can, for EC2 instances, you are using auto scaling group, which will take care of automatically scaling it and since this is serverless you don't have to worry about the database so both the services have high availability and automatically scalable the company is planning to migrate data to s3 bucket the data must be encrypted at rest within the s3 bucket the encryption key must be rotated automatically every year which solution will meet least operational overhead i mean at rest gives us that we have to use KMS and all the options are using KMS other than option A. You can use SSC S3 but we are talking about rotated automatically every year. Okay, now let's go through options. Okay, A, B, C and D. Um, let's look at option B. Encryption at rest. So using a customer managed key for S3 encryption allows more control over encryption keys and policies and automatic key rotation can be enabled for the customer managed KMS key reducing operational overhead while automatic key rotation can be enabled managing a customer managed KMS key adds some operational overhead compared to um, managed keys by AWS so for that reason we will cancel it out because remember it, it has to be least operational overhead and same thing applies to C because it is also using customer managed key and if you look at option D even here it is some trying to do import the customer key material uh, which is option D right so this option uses customer key material to encrypt data providing control over encryption keys uh, but 
managing customer key material and importing into KMS adds complexity and operational overhead. So cross it out. So instead we will go with option A because it is using a S3 managed key, which means we don't manage it. S3 manages it for us. Okay, and these keys are managed by AWS and key rotation is handled automatically without any additional configuration. So this is the least operational overhead compared with other options. The company is migrating applications from an on-premises Microsoft Active Directory that the company manages to AWS. The company deploys the applications in multiple AWS accounts. The company uses organizations to manage the accounts centrally. The company security team needs a single sign-on solution across all the company's AWS accounts. The company must continue to manage users and groups that are in the on-premises active directory. Must continue. Which solution will meet these requirements? All right. Option A involves deploying an AWS managed Microsoft AD in AWS directory service and configuring it as the identity source by IAM identity center. While this setup can provide integration between IAM and AWS managed AD, it does not directly integrate with the company's on-premises active directory. Users and groups from the on-premises active directory would need to be synchronized or manually managed in the AWS managed Microsoft AD, which could add complexity and overhead. So for that reason, we will cross it out. We, wa we want to use the existing one in the on-premise through AWS. That's what we want, not create a new one on AWS. Option C, there are some similarities between B and C, but let's go uh, option C involves establishing a trust relationship between the company's on-premises active directory and AWS directory service. However, AWS directory service does not inherently provide IAM identity center capabilities. Additional configuration would be needed to integrate with IAM for single sign-on across AWS accounts because this one is not talking anything about IAM identity center. And option D, involves deploying and managing an identity provider on EC2 which adds operational overhead. It also requires manual configuration to link the IDP as an identity source within IAM identity center. While it's technically feasible, it may not be the most efficient or scalable solution compared to utilizing AWS directory service or IAM identity center directly which is what our option B is doing. This involves establishing a trust relationship between the company's on-premises active directory and AWS IAM identity center using AWS directory service for Microsoft AD. It allows for single sign-on across AWS accounts by leveraging the existing on-premises active directory for user authentication. With a two-way trust relationship, users and groups managed in the on-premises active directory can be used to access AWS resources without needing to duplicate user management efforts, which is what option A is doing. So for that reason, B is the perfect solution for this scenario. The company is planning to deploy its application on Amazon Aurora PostgreSQL serverless version 2 cluster. The application will receive large amounts of traffic the company wants to optimize the storage performance of the cluster as the load on the application increases. Which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively? So this is trying to test us different storages that are available on the Aurora database. Okay, let's go through the options. Option A is trying to use Aurora standard storage configuration and we already know without even understanding this usually the standard storages are not that cheap. Um, it, it does provide a balance of performance and cost. It dynamically adjusts storage capacity based on the workloads needs. However, it may not provide the highest level of performance during peak traffic loads as it prioritizes cost effectiveness over performance and we are trying to optimize the storage performance with the cheap. So it has to be cheap but it has to optimize the storage performance at the same time. Option B, provisioned IOPS allows you to specify a consistent level of input output performance by provisioning a specific amount of IOPS. 
while this option ensures predictable performance it may not be the most cost effective solution especially if application workload varies significantly over time provisioned iops typically incurs higher costs compared to, compared to other storage types and option d aurora io optimized storage is designed to deliver high levels of io performance for demanding workloads it is optimized for applications with high throughput and low latency requirements while this option may provide the best performance it may also come with higher cost compared to other storage configurations so which one do we pick we'll go ahead and pick the general purpose why general purpose because this provides a baseline level of performance with the ability to boost to higher levels when needed only when needed remember it offers a good balance of performance and cost making it suitable for workloads with varying levels of activity this option can provide adequate performance for the application while optimizing costs especially if the workload experiences periodic spikes in traffic that's what we are looking for a financial services company that runs on aws has designed its security controls to meet industry standards the industry standards include the national institute of standards and technology and the payment card industry data security standard the company's third party auditors need proof that the designed controls have been implemented and are functioning correctly the company has hundreds of aws accounts in a single organization in the aws organizations the company needs to monitor the current state of controls across accounts which solution will meet these requirements let's look at the options option a this option involves designating one aws account as the inspector delegated administrator account and integrating it with organizations inspector would be used to discover and scan resources across all aws accounts with nist and pcci industry standards enabled for security assignments while inspector can perform security assessments it's primarily focused on host and application level vulnerabilities while it can provide valuable insights into specific vulnerabilities it may not offer the comprehensive monitoring and compliance checks required across the entire aws environment additionally inspector is not optimized for continuous monitoring and compliance reporting across multiple accounts so for that reason we will eliminate this one and option b this option um designates one account as guard duty delegated administrator account enabling guard duty to protect all member accounts within the organization nist and dss standards are enabled for threat detection and here the guard duty is what it is a threat detection service rather than a comprehensive compliance monitoring tool while it can detect suspicious activity and potential threats it may not provide the extensive compliance checks needed to ensure adherence to industry standards like nist and dss guard duty is more focused on detecting malicious activity rather than ensuring compliance with specific security standards so that's again eliminated and option c involves configuring aws cloud trail organization trail in the organization's management account and designating one account as the compliance account cloud trail security standards for nist dss are enabled in the compliance account while cloud trail is essential for auditing and logging aws api activity it's primarily focused on providing an audit trail rather than actively monitoring and ensuring compliance cloud trail can capture api activity and changes made to aws resources but it may not offer the comprehensive compliance checks and real time monitoring capabilities needed to ensure adherence to industry standards across multiple accounts so that will leave us with our superhero in this case it is the security hub that we are looking for this option designates one account as the security hub delegated administrator account and enable security hub for all member accounts within the organization then the these two standards are enabled for compliance checks and the security hub is specifically designed for centralized security monitoring and compliance check across aws environments it aggregates findings from various security services and third party tools providing a comprehensive view of security alerts and compliance status by enabling security hub standards 
for NIST and DSS, the company can ensure continuous evaluation of its security posture against these industry standards across all accounts within the organization. The company uses an S3 bucket as its data lake storage platform. The S3 bucket contains a massive amount of data that is assessed randomly by multiple teams and hundreds of applications. The company wants to reduce the storage S3 storage costs and provide immediate availability for frequently accessed objects. What is the most operationally efficient solution that meets these requirements? Accessed randomly. So if you see the pattern is random or unknown or etc., just blindly go for intelligent steering. Since you don't know what is the access pattern, you cannot pick a class, right? Because if you know the class, you can go and say like, oh, this is accessed twice a year, so I will go for Glacier, or it is accessed multiple times a year, though I will go for infrequent. But we don't know. So whenever you hear the word accessed randomly or they don't know the pattern, just go for intelligent steering. And lucky for us, only one option is using intelligent steering, which is option A. Okay, so for that, you just go for this one. The company has 5 TB of data sets. The data sets consist of 1 million user profiles and 10 million connections. The user profiles have connections as many to many relationships. The company needs a performance efficient way to find mutual connections up to five levels with solution. So this is this, whenever you hear the word connections, user profiles, it's indirectly asking you for a graph database. And there is only one service on AWS that supports the graph database, which is Neptune. So just go ahead and pick that because connection between relationships, it's not uh, possible with any other options because it has million users and 10 million and it will keep on increasing it. Neptune is designed for that. A company needs a secure connection between its on-premises environment and AWS. This connection does not need high bandwidth and will handle a small amount of traffic. The connection setup should be set up quickly. What is the most cost-effective method to establish this one? Okay. First of all, you can immediately eliminate direct connect because this takes at least a month to happen. And it's definitely not most cost effective because you, you need to reach out to your uh, cable provider and they will lay cable between your company and AWS. So it's not cheap. And again, it's a small amount of traffic which you can ignore that. So let's go through other options. Client to VPN. This allows the remote users to securely connect to AWS resources from their devices. While a client VPN can provide secure access, it may not be the most suitable option for connecting an entire on-premise environment to AWS. Client VPNs are typically used for individual user access rather than connecting entire networks. And option C, a bastion host is a special purpose instance that acts as a gateway for securing accessing AWS resources from the on-premises environment. While a bastion host provides a secure entry point into the environment, it does not establish a dedicated connection between the on-premises environment and AWS. So that will leave us with AWS site-to-site -site VPN connection. This one establishes a secure encrypted tunnel between the on-premises network and AWS. It allows traffic to flow securely between the two environments, providing connectivity without the need for high bandwidth. Site-to-site -site VPN connections are relatively quick to set up and are more are suitable for scenarios where a small amount of traffic needs to traverse between environments securely. This option aligns closely with the requirements and is likely the most cost-effective method for establishing the required connection. For that reason, we'll pick option D. The company has an on-premises SFTP file server solution. The company is migrating to the AWS cloud to scale the file transfer solution and to optimize costs by using S3. The company's employees will use their credentials for the on-premises Active Directory to access the new solution. Will use their credentials. Okay. Company wants to keep the current authentication and file access mechanisms. 
which solution will meet these requirements with least operational overhead so they want to still use the file transfer solution sftp which means we already uh, have seen a question similar to this so we have to use aws transfer family and they want to keep their own ad solution so we cannot do anything about our moving or migrating okay so for that reason which options are using transfer family options c and d so you can eliminate these two between c and d what is the difference first of all this says transfer family sftp endpoint there is no such thing actually it is transfer family server with sftp endpoint let's assume that may be a typo let's take the configure the endpoint to use the aws directory service option as the identity provider do you see anything missing yes it is trying to connect to aws service option which is like uh, to connect to existing active directory on aws there is no mentioning of how you want to connect to the on premises okay so what you can do is you can choose aws directory service option as the identity provider then you will use ad connector to connect the on premises active directory this is what you will try to use not this one okay so this is not mentioning how you are connecting to your on premises if you want to learn more about this you can read this one i specifically googled this for you guys so if you i think somewhere i thought there was a picture of it maybe not maybe not this one but anyways you can go ahead and read this one using active directory for uh, this one for transfer family okay the company is designing an event driven order processing system each order requires multiple validation steps after the order is created an item potent aws lambda function performs each validation step each validation step is independent from the other validation steps individual validation steps need only a subset of the order event information the company wants to ensure that each validation step lambda function has access to only the information from the order event that the function requires the components of the order processing system should be loosely coupled to accommodate business changes which solution will meet these requirements usually whenever we think of loosely coupled we'll pick sqs but in this case that should not divert you because there are other loosely coupled solutions as well so let's go through the options let's go through option a in this approach each validation step has its own sqs queue and a lambda function transforms the order data and publishes messages to the appropriate sqs queue okay this solution definitely offers loose coupling between validation steps and allows each lambda function to receive only the information it needs but again you are using another lambda function to transform this lambda function will receive all the data though okay remember that but setting up and managing multiple sqs queues and orchestrating the transformation and message publishing logic could introduce some complexity so we are not going to go with that and then option b involves using sns topic to which all validation step lambda functions subscribe sns message body filtering is utilized to send only the required data to each subscribe lambda function while this approach offers loose coupling and message filtering capabilities sns filtering is limited compared to the option that we are going to pick which is event bridge transformations capabilities so option d which is similar to option a uh, uses a single sqs queue and a lambda function to transform the order data and invoke validation step lambda function synchronously while this solution may simplifies the architecture by using a single queue the synchronous invocation of lambda functions may not be most efficient approach especially if the validation steps can be executed concurrently and creating a separate lambda function just to format it again extra step which you can avoid by using option c which is event bridge this allows creating event rules for each validation step and configuring input transformers to send only the required data to each target lambda function remember the event bridge transformation has limitations but our question is only asking to select a subset of the event which is totally possible with the event bridge input transformation 
So this approach provides loose coupling and enables fine-grained control over the event data sent to each validation step lambda function. Event bridge input transformation capabilities make it suitable for this scenario as it allows for extracting subsets of event data effectively. This is, you know, this is a new option that AWS is trying to test you on. A company is migrating a three-tier application to AWS. The application requires a MySQL database. In the past, the application users reported poor application performance when creating new entries. These performance issues were caused by users generating different real-time reports from the application during work hours. I mean, this, this is just hinting at reading because of reading that is happening and we know what exactly to do when to reduce read load. Which solution will improve the performance of the application when it is moved to AWS? Okay, let's go through option A. DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service. By importing date MySQL data, which is a RDBMS into DynamoDB, and we refactor it, maybe uh, it will benefit from DynamoDB scalability load latency, but DynamoDB may require significant application refactoring, especially if the application is less heavily on SQL queries that are not easily translated to DynamoDB's query model. Of course, we won't go with that. Option B, while running MySQL on compute optimized EC2 instance might provide better performance compared to on-premises hardware, it may not fully address the scalability and performance issues during peak usage periods. Technically, we don't pick EC2s since we have managed services which are better. Why do you want to pick that one? And then we have C and D both are using Aurora multi-easy DB cluster, but one with read replicas. And as I mentioned, they are going to ask about read because the performance is affecting when the uh, re real-time reports are reading from the database so obviously option C will be the answer because this one uh, we are creating AZ with multiple read replicas okay what does this do using the reader endpoint for reports allows read traffic to be distributed among read replicas reducing the load on the primary instance during report generation for that reason we will go with C instead of D. The company is expanding a secure on-premises network to the AWS cloud by using an AWS Direct Connect connection. The on-premises network has no direct internet access. An application that runs on the on-premises network needs to use an Amazon S3 bucket. Which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively? Option A, this would require routing AWS traffic over a public WIF virtual interface, which means the traffic would traverse the public internet. Since the on-premises network has no direct internet access, this solution would not meet the requirement of keeping the network secure. Additionally, routing traffic over the public internet may introduce security risks and potential latency issues. Option B involves creating a VPC in AWS and configuring a NAT gateway to allow the on-premises network to access resources in the VPC. The NAT gateway would provide outbound internet access for resources in the VPC, allowing the on-premises application to access the S3 bucket securely. While this solution provides secure access to S3 bucket, it may not be the most cost-effective solution as NAT gateways incur additional costs based on usage. And what did we discuss when they ask, you know, a particular service to access without traversing the public or no internet direct access? Remember endpoints or private link. Just remember that, okay? I mean that even here C is the answer, but I'm just telling you, you don't have to go through options. So D is trying to use VPC peering, which allows communication between VPCs, but it does not extend to on-premise networks connected via direct connect. Gone. So. We are left with option C. 
involves creating a VPC in AWS and configuring an S3 interface endpoint in the VPC. Interface endpoint allows communication between resources in the VPC and S3 without requiring internet access. By routing traffic to the S3 internet endpoint, the on-premises application can securely access the S3 bucket without traversing the public internet. This solution is cost effective as it eliminates the need for NAT gateway and minimizes data transfer costs. A company serves its websites by using an auto-scaling group of Amazon EC2 instances in a single AWS region. The website does not require a database. The company is expanding and the company's engineering team deploys the website to a second region. The company wants to distribute traffic across both regions to accommodate growth and for disaster recovery purposes. The solution should not serve traffic from a region in which the website is unhealthy. Which policy or resource should the company use to meet these requirements? Should not serve traffic from a region in which website is unhealthy. Okay, let's go through the options. Option A, the simple routing policy which allows you to specify only one resource record set such as an IP address or DNS name for a given domain name. It does not support routing traffic to multiple endpoints or health checks across multiple regions. Therefore, this option does not meet the requirement of distributing across multiple regions or ensuring that unhealthy regions are not used. Option C, using an ALB allows you to distribute traffic across multiple EC2 instances or targets within a single region. However, ALB cannot distribute traffic across multiple regions by default. Even if you specify EC2 instance IDs from both regions in a target group, ALB can only route traffic to targets within its own region. So that will apply to option D as well. So we are left with option B. The multi-value answer routing policy allows you to specify multiple healthy records for a single DNS name. Route 53 responds to DNS queries with up to eight healthy records selected at random. This policy supports routing policy, so routing traffic to multiple endpoints, which can be EC2 instances in different regions. A company runs its applications on Amazon EC2 instances that are backed by EBS. The EC2 instances run the most recent Linux release. The applications are experiencing availability issues when the company's employees store and retrieve files that are 25 GB or larger. The company needs a solution that does not require the, com require the company to transfer files between EC2 instances. The files must be available across many EC2 instances and across multiple availability zones. So this is, is a give, easy giveaway. It has to be available across many instances, which means they have to be shared between EC2 instances. So it's talking about EFS, which you can share between any number of EC2 instances. Okay. So not EBS and none of these. So I think we luckily we have only one option that is using EFS. So you can go ahead and pick that immediately, which is option C. Right? We, I think this is, a, we have done this co similar question so many times. A company is running a highly sensitive application on EC2 backend by an RDS database. Complaints regulations mandate that all personally identifiable information be encrypted at rest. Which solution should a solutions architect recommend to meet this requirement? The least amount of changes to infrastructure. Okay, we already know Encrypted at rest means KMS or any um, service related encryption service, right? It's not certificate. Certificates are for encryption in transit. And Cloud HSM is a hardware device. Okay. And uh, it is a hardware security module service and generating encryption keys. Yeah, we can use it, but again, it involves operational overhead. So let's not go with that. And option C, 
mentions configuring SSL encryption using KMS keys, but it's not clear how this specifically addresses encrypting data address on the volumes. So again, we are going to go with option D because it's using EBS encryption, which allows to encrypt the EBS volumes attached to a EC2 instance and RDS encryption, which supports encryption of data address using KMS keys. Okay, so combining these two with KMS keys provides a comprehensive solution for encrypting both the instance volumes and the database volumes. This ensures that all sensitive data, including PA, is encrypted at rest, thereby meeting compliance regulations. A company runs an AWS Lambda function in private subnets in a VPC. The subnets have a default route to the internet through an Amazon EC2 NAT instance. The Lambda function processes input data and saves its output as an object to S3. Intermittently, the Lambda function times out while trying to upload the object because of saturated traffic on NAT instances network. The company wants to access S3 without traversing the internet. Wow, what? How many did we see? Five questions, I guess. Without traversing Okay, the answer is either private link or an endpoint. And since we are talking about S3, it has to be gateway endpoint. And specifically, it has to be gateway interface endpoint. Anyways, if we look at it, I think option C is the one we are looking for. Not transit gateway. We have already gone through this, so I'm not going through explaining them again. So option is C, which is gateway endpoint for Amazon S3. Amazon VPC endpoints enable private connectivity between your VPC and supported AWS services. By provisioning a gateway endpoint for S3 in the VPC, the Lambda function can access S3 directly without traffic leaving the AWS network or traversing the internet. This ensures that the Lambda function can upload objects to S3 without encountering timeouts due to network congestion on the NAT instance. And the final question for this video, news company that has reporters all over the world is hosting its broadcast system on AWS. The reporters save, send a live broadcast to the broadcast system. The reporters use software on their phones to send live streams through the real-time messaging protocol. Solutions Architect must design a solution that gives the reporters the ability to send the highest quality streams. The solution must provide accelerated TCP connections back to the broadcast system. What should the Solutions Architect use to meet these requirements? So many people will confuse between A and B, but it's definitely not CloudFront because it is a content delivery network service that accelerates the delivery of content to end users. While CloudFront can improve the delivery of static dynamic content, it is primarily designed for content caching and distribution to end users rather than accelerating TCP connections back to a centralized system. So it may not be the optimal choice for real-time streaming and ensuring accelerated connections for reporters. I mean, accelerated accelerated you can go ahead and blindly pick that one <laughs> option c is vpn client vpn is a managed vpn service that allows users to securely access aws resources and on-premises networks from anywhere using a open vpn based clients while client vpn provides secure access to resources it does not inherently offer accelerated tcp connections or optimization for real-time streaming scenarios it is more focused on providing secure remote access rather than optimizing network performance and that is gone and option d deploying ec2 instances and associating them with elastic ip addresses does not inherently provide accelerated tcp connections or optimization for real-time streaming while ec2 instances can handle network traffic and can be optimized for performance managing them to ensure accelerated connections and high quality streams for reporters would require additional configuration and maintenance. Instead, we would go for dedicated networking services like AWS Global Accelerator. Sorry, I don't know why I did this. Let's underline this one. 
it is a networking service that improves the availability and performance of applications with global users it uses the aws global network to optimize the path from users to applications improving the performance of tcp and udp traffic global accelerator can provide accelerated tcp connections back to the broadcast system making it suitable for real-time streaming scenarios where low latency and high performance connections are crucial this option aligns well with the requirements of the news company okay that's the end of this video i hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to like and comment each video and if you haven't subscribed to the channel then this is an awesome time to subscribe and uh, also, if you want to support the channel, you can become a member. And if you are interested in real-time projects, we have two playlists which are called AWS Cloud Quest and AWS Cloud Projects for Beginner to Expert. In combination, we have total 98 projects. Most of them talk about the scenarios which we covered as questions in these analysis videos. So don't forget about that. And as I mentioned previously, if you are looking for a complete PDF questions with answers for any certification exam that is not on my channel, you can ask me. It will cost you $25 because I have to go and bring it from somewhere else. That being said, thank you very much for hanging out here. I really, really appreciate your time. And uh, see you in the next video. Have a great day. Peace out.